welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study. It's Thursdays at 4. And uh, before I introduce our, our speakers today, I'll just make a quick announcement. Next Thursday's, uh, Thursday at 4 is called News from the Dead, An Unnatural Moment in the History of Natural Philosophy with Jane Taylor, who is a professor in Drama and Theater Studies at Leeds University. But this will, today will be a natural moment in unnatural philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Linked programs. Um, so today's talk, which is uh, the unnatural moment in that, <laughs> is why philosophy here and now, uh, critical and transformative challenges to a conservative discipline. And the talk is sponsored by, co-sponsored by philosophy, political science, gender, women, and sexuality studies, African American and African studies, and the Women's Center. And before we um, get lost, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Professor Dotson is also speaking tomorrow, um, and the title of her talk is Theorizing Jane Crow, Theorizing Unknowability. And it'll be tomorrow afternoon at 3.30 in the Carlson School Room L110. So um, if you can't get enough today, which I'm sure will be the case, you can try again tomorrow afternoon at 3.30 in the Carlson School. So our, our dialogists today are Christy Dotson, who is an associate professor of philosophy at Michigan State University, where she teaches epistemology, critical philosophy of race, and feminist philosophy, and particularly women of color feminism and feminist epistemology. She's currently working on a book manuscript under contract with Oxford, so we hope we'll be seeing it soon, called Varieties of Ep Epistemic Oppression. Now, Naomi Sheeman is probably known to most of you in the room, and I apologize to Professor Dotson for this unequal introduction, but let's us <laughs> We don't often have a chance to um, give a full, um, uh, fuller description of Naomi, who we depend on regularly for her probing and insightful questions and comments. So you probably know Naomi Sheeman is Professor of Philosophy and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies here at the University of Minnesota. Her research interests include politics of, ep of epistemi epistemology, let me try that one again, uh, feminist theory, transgender studies, responsibility and research, trustworthiness, and public engagement. She earned her baccalaureate degree from Barnard College and her PhD in philosophy from Harvard University, and she's taught here at Minnesota since 1979. Among her many publications are two monographs in Genderings, Constructions of Knowledge, Authority, and Privilege, published by Rutledge, and most recently, Shifting Ground, Knowledge and Reality, Transgression, and Trustworthiness. She has been, among many other positions here at the university, the Imagine Chair in Humanities, Arts, and Design from 2012 to 2014. But more important to most of us, she has been a member of the current member of the IAS board, a longtime friend of the Institute for Advanced Study, a dedicated participant in faculty governance, and a model, I think, for what it really means to be a community-engaged scholar, not just as a member of various community uh, consulting committees and policy groups within the university trying to move us into engaged scholarship, but a, a genuine designer of new methods for research, dispute resolution, and understanding our relationship with the people outside the walls of the university. So it's my great pleasure and kind of sadness to say uh, that uh, this may be Naomi's last public presentation at the IAS, but um, welcome Naomi and Christy Dawson. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Christy, for uh, letting me in on this. This was originally scheduled as Christy's event, and then when I was asked what I wanted to do to mark my retirement, I said, I want to have a couple of conversations with Christy. And she, she said, okay. So that, that's how this came about. And uh, thanks to the IAS in particular, and uh, to my departments, especially to the philosophy department, Valerie Tiberius, the chair, for helping to make this happen. 
Um, it's going to be very, very, very hard to leave this place. Uh, the closer it gets, the harder it feels. And um, anyway, it's going to be hard. Um, so there are two sorts of things we want to be talking about. One is this bizarre, we think, discipline that we're in. And what's strange about it, and in particular, why, compared to any other of the humanities in particular, it's so resistant to you know, any kind of diversity that is anything other than um, European, heterosexual, Christian, uh, wealthy men, right, essentially. Um, and there's, I think there are interesting reasons for that. But in the face of that, how come we do it? Um, and not only do we do philosophy, we're both epistemologists. And epistemology is kind of the heart of the heart of the beast. Um, and what is it? But then the other part of it is, um, why <coughs> is it that in different ways, we have each found being an epistemologist a particularly useful thing to be? engaged in various kinds of transformation. Um, uh, for me, primarily, you know, within the university, for Christie, a lot of it, um, some of the university, but a lot of it outside more broadly. Christie is much more seriously engaged with social justice, anti-racist work outside the university than, than I am, and I learn a lot from her about what that means. Um, so, I want to start a little bit by um, saying how we got into this by way of sort of setting the critical stage, because our stories are extremely different. I got into this back when I first started, at, uh, started college at Barnard College, a uh, women's um, college in New York City. Um, it was 1964. Um, which is, of course, a very, very, very long time ago, but um, in particular before second wave feminism. Um, Barnard was in many ways a very feminist place, but that didn't have a kind of critical edge to it. It just meant, of course, you're all going to go on to do wonderful things because you're wonderful people, and, and my teachers were women. And um, I fell in love with philosophy in my first philosophy class. Um, and the experience that I had, I described then and have described it since, as it felt like hearing my native language spoken for the first time. Um, it felt like everything else I had done, everything school related, but also a lot of the rest of my life, I had been doing in translation. And it felt like discovering what kind of animal I was. Um, and I was completely, uncritically, madly in love with the field, uh, which had nothing whatsoever to do with feminism or anything else political. I mean, I was very political. My parents were communists. I'd been involved in the civil rights movement, in the anti-Vietnam War movement, but politics was over there, philosophy was over there. They had nothing whatsoever to do with each other. There was also this other piece, which was the bride piece. They had that, you know, was also completely separate. Anyway, um, so it was totally fragmented in that way. And I just adored philosophy. And I had no idea that particularly epistemology and metaphysics, which was the part that I adored, had anything to do with politics. I had, I had no sense of alienation from it whatsoever. Um, that didn't last. Um, <laughs> somewhere around about the middle of graduate school, I started developing and, in fact, cultivating a sense of alienation. And I ended up writing the first feminist dissertation in that department. Um, and what, the way I've come to think about what philosophy is, and this is partly how I describe it to introductory students, is that philosophers are sort of developmentally stuck at the age of three. Um, Three-year-olds are the ones who keep on asking why. And you think you've explained it perfectly well. And maybe you have to a 35-year-old, but not to a three-year-old. They're going to come back and ask why again. And most people get over that. 
And they learn to ask only properly framed questions with a method for answering them and answers, right? Those are good questions, the ones that can be properly framed and properly asked with a method and answered and then you go on to some new questions. And a bunch of us just don't ever get over that. And what those questions are is they're the leftover residue of becoming a particular kind of person. All of those, that unanswered stuff that most people just learn to, you know, good enough, just get on with the series, you know. <laughs> and, but what I came to realize is that nobody just becomes a person. Everybody becomes a particular kind of person in a particular time and place. And who they are in that time and place, who they're expected to be, how they're expected to think, how they're expected to be disciplined or to be incapable of being disciplined. And that the problems of philosophy, what we think of within the field as just the problems of philosophy, and we have to learn how to motivate our students to have those problems because they don't come in usually with those problems, um, are the ones that were carefully and very, very politically articulated in early modern Europe around creating Europe. Um, Europe needed to be created. It is not a proper continent. It is an idea and it needed to be created as an idea and they needed to create the proper person who would be the European bourgeois man, capable of standing on his own feet, capable of being an authority, capable of coming to knowledge on his own, not asking the Pope or the King, capable of doing science and you know capitalism and the nation state, all that kind of stuff. This guy needed to be created and created as generic, as exemplifying the essence of what it is to be human. It turned out that this essence of what it is to be human is exemplified by an actually rather tiny fraction of the world's population. <laughs> um, and that the majority of the world's population were somehow deemed incapable of exemplifying the essence of their own species, which when you think about it is a little bit odd. Um, and consequently, those others were set up for being colonized, killed, enslaved, subordinated in various ways, and so on. And the residue of the constitution of that privileged because generic self are the problems of philosophy, most centrally, as I and others have worked on, the problems of skepticism. That is, if you constitute yourself that way by pushing the world away, establishing yourself as separate and distinct from your own body, from other people, hand in hand with God, going to go out there and do it all, it's no wonder you wonder whether this stuff exists. I mean, you so vigorously pushed it away and detached yourself from it, bingo, you've got the problem of skepticism. Right? That's why that guy's got that problem, and we've inherited it with supposedly no politics attached to it, but it's the residue, it's, the, it's that three-year-old guy. It's the residue of his you know, attempt. So that's the kind of, of alienation I had to cultivate. And then, you know, somehow stick with it and do it. And then, so I got this job. I lost my first job, and I got this job, which was better, so it was okay. So, and I got tenure without any trouble at all, and had this horrible, oh my God, whom have I betrayed in order to get this? Why do they think I'm a good girl? All my life I've been a good girl. My sister is here, she knows I was real, I was older, she was the bad girl, I was the good girl. I, never, I didn't particularly like it, but it sort of bred so deep me. And I thought, I want to be a bad girl, but apparently they think I'm a good girl, and they're giving me tenure, and they're not giving me a hard time, and what's going on wrong here? Well, I came up for promotion to full, and that didn't quite go quite as easily. <laughs> Um, I got it, and a majority of my senior colleagues supported me, but five or six of them didn't. They actually correctly used the word meretricious in describing my work. Um, but I got it. I got promoted anyway, but I actually felt kind of tough and swaggery, so they get it. I'm not a good girl after all, and I'm trying to change things. And we did have radically different visions of what philosophy should be. And the one that I had, they saw as problematic. Well, I, damn it, it is problematic. <laughs> but part of the point for hanging in there 
and for sticking with it, aside from the fact that, conflicted as I am, I still do just love it. And I've had a wonderful career here, and I've worked with amazing colleagues and fantastic students, many of whom are here, um, is to help open up the space for people who are not good girls, <laughs> who are going to be a whole lot more discombobulating and disconcerting than I can manage to be, who are going to do really tough radical work, and that I can help make it possible you know, help in some small way. So I was asked to be a referee when Chrissy came up for tenure at MSU. So I'm going to read you some of the passages from the letter, and then Chrissy can tell you how she got into this strange business. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing to get asked on something, but I'm going to be asked as the bad girl? Come on, man. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to own that. I'll own that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the striking features of Professor Dotson's career is the integration of her research, teaching, and service. In her writing, she argues for the need for philosophy both to learn from and to usefully address the experiences, perspectives, and concerns of black women, and she demonstrates the results of doing so. But she is acutely aware that it takes more than good arguments to affect these transformations. It takes people, including the students she mentors with amazing energy and dedication, um, and it takes institutional change, an arena to which she also devotes considerable energy and dedication at MSU as well as nationally and internationally, making her a recognized and respected leader at a strikingly early stage in her career. Skipping over. I was especially struck by a metaphilosophical connection between this paper called Tracking Epistemic Violence, Tracking Practices of Silencing, and Radical Love, which is another paper. She has wonderful titles. Um, namely, her shining light on black women's theorizing, including when it anticipates the later work of others, notably, in this case, white women, whose contributions tend to get more attention from the philosophical mainstream. In particular, Dotson shows how Patricia Hill Collins's discussion of the ways in which black women are discounted as knowers anticipates Miranda Fricker's work on testimonial injustice. You're one of the few people who read that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just a hug out of love. Um, that's just love right there. Patricia <laughs> Collins that's exactly is a, what I was doing. a black feminist <laughs> sociologist and, feminist and theorist, and Miranda Fricker is a, a white feminist philosopher. Mm -hmm. This is one of the places where I was personally struck by the force of Dotson's analysis and critique. I think of myself, a white woman, in case you haven't noticed, as reasonably attentive to issues of race and racism, including within philosophy, and I've read and even taught Collins's work many times, but I confess to not having made the connection when I was reading and thinking about Fricker. The depth and intransigence of the blockages to being a competent interlocutor, a listener who does not inflict violence on those who try to speak to her, is painful to admit. And reading Dotson's work forces me to do just that, something for which I am deeply grateful. Now, in Black Feminist Me, another of her pieces, she grapples with pervasive anti-theory impulses in much Black feminist thought. Given her sympathy with such a stance, she asks, what is she doing being a philosopher? <laughs> what does it mean to be a black feminist philosopher? Her answers are deeply, vulnerably honest, and they point to the ways in which the practice of philosophy will need to change, and in hands such as Dotson's is changing, if it is to speak to the concerns and to learn from the perspectives of black women. On Dotson's account, echoed implicitly in others of her papers, theory produces ignorance by foreclosing <laughs> other ways of knowing. In contrast, she endorses an anti-theory form of philosophical practice that she refers to as reading, not a matter of individual intent, and that draws on and calls for understanding a cognitive inheritance. She notes the value of conceptual transparency, meaning by that not the reduction of complexity to, for example, necessary and sufficient conditions, but rather interpreting so as to understand the sense someone has made. And she sees affinities between what feminist professional philosophers value as conceptual transparency and what black feminists value, affinities that can be built on while remaining attentive to the ways in which some acts of reading are facilitated and others thwarted. The paper she co-authored with Kyle White, also at MSU, Environmental Justice, puts black feminist thought to work on questions that might seem distant from its usual concerns. 
Drawing on insights articulated in others of her papers, they appeal to, so they, Kyle White and Christy Dotson, appeal to um, socially sanctioned, situated ignorance to criticize, for example, a toxicologist who praises uh, Aquasasne people for changing their traditional diet to avoid eating contaminated fish. Uh, reminds me of Kate Derrickson's work on the problems with resilience. That is, aren't they wonderfully resilient? They've learned how not to eat the fish that somebody else is contaminating. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. in bringing insights from black feminism to bear on accounts of environmental justice, the paper calls attention to aspects of moral obtuseness that are under-theorized, even in accounts attentive to the moral epistemology of oppression. In particular, they discuss the phenomenon of absent presence, that is, abjected differences, experiences, and perspectives explicitly beyond the scope of legitimate concern. They call for unqualified interdependence or unqualified affectability, a recognition of our uncircumscribable vulnerability to human and non-human others as a material reality and as a theater theoretical stance. Again, a metaphilosophical argument for a mode of philosophizing that aims to do justice to the complexities of the world, even as experienced by those on or outside of the margins of power and privilege. Um, and finally, in summary, Christy Dotson is a stunningly impressive philosopher determined to play a role in reshaping the profession, something she is clearly capable of doing and that she has already made a significant start on. I have been challenged by reading her work and I look forward to what this field will become as the transformation she is helping to lead moves forward as I am confident it will. Michigan State was wise to hire her and has clearly been an excellent place for her to build her career. I admire you for that and envy your having her as a colleague. And I, I am pleased to say and proud to say that I have Christy Dotson as a colleague in the world in general and as a friend. You know, I, I have set it up so that you yourself are a hard act to follow. I know. Who is that person? Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it speaks to the generosity of Naomi that she would spend seven minutes of her final lecture talking about somebody else. I think it, it says something about you, and it says something about you. I mean, I'm almost in tears because... So I've gotten like at least 20 emails from people saying, you get to be at Naomi's retirement thing. <laughs> I'm so jealous. And I've actually been a um, bit of an ass about it. Like, I do. <laughs> and you won't be. I mean, I, I mean, I am probably more the bad girl than I should be. Because I was like, I'm not even going to be modest about that. That show is going to be me. I'm going to be there. Um, I didn't expect that. So thank you very much for the letter, for tenure, you know, all that good stuff. <laughs> um, and that introduction. We, we do have different trajectories into the field, um, and Naomi asked me to talk a bit about that, and I, and I will. So I think that I've had a great deal more alienation with respect to philosophy. I think um, I did not get into philosophy as an undergrad. I had other majors, business, English, and African American studies as an undergrad. I went and got a master's in literature, literary theory to be specific, and I was working on literary theory when the field was collapsing. So, you know, um, when the field collapsed, they were, I was going to go and get a PhD, and literally the advice I got was, okay, well, if you want to do theory, I guess you got to go into philosophy now, because that's all there is. <laughs> and um, I, I actually believed that shit, because I didn't know any better. And um, I went and, you know, to a PhD program in philosophy. So my first philosophy, professional philosophy class, or philosophy training class, was a graduate class, a PhD class on Kant's ethics. <laughs> you know, it's one of those moments where you look up like, where the hell am I? Like, I don't know. I went from Levinas and to Kant. I don't know what happened. Um, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting, eye-opening experience um, because um, I, I wasn't raised in philosophy. I wasn't uh, somehow raised in the religiosity of the dogma of philosophy. So when I was there around people who were raised in philosophy, it was very apparent to me that I had a different value set. I had a very different understanding of what it meant to theorize. I had a very different understanding of what it meant to be a theorizer in the world. Um, and I was too old to change that. I mean, at that point, I was uh, <laughs> got into my PhD program around 24, 25. I wasn't young. 
I wasn't old, I wasn't young, and but I wasn't I wasn't impressionable, I guess that's the thing. So when I got there and they were, you know, talking what I consider to be craziness, it sounded like craziness to me. You know, I was like, I'm sorry. I mean, because Kant had this class the second day, the professor was like, you realize if Kant died as a baby, um, the world would be different. No. <laughs> I don't realize that. And your fan fiction is all up in my face. Right now. Like, I mean, I don't know what's happening right now. Kant could have died as a baby and not a damn thing would change. We'd be in here reading about somebody else. But the same fucking place, I'll tell you that. I mean, so there's these things that people were like, yeah, of course. I was like, no, not of course. <laughs> no, not of course. Where does that logic come from? Where does the logic come from that these people wrote? I mean, that, you know, a set of Europeans, as you've already called them to question, can actually shape our world with this stroke of a pen. Who believes that? <laughs> I mean, who believes that? I, I know lots of people do, but I didn't. I never did, right? I never, 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 never did. So in that first moment, I thought, oh, no, I am not going to make it. You know, I'm not going to make it. But then I was also 24, 25, and my parents were looking at me like, you're almost 30. You're about to... We're about to start talking about you, right? So at this moment, like, this has to work. <laughs> I'm in a PhD program. I can get a job maybe when I'm done, and I, I might have to make it work. So in some ways, I gave it more time than my other. Um, so I was in a program that had literally, there was probably around eight to nine black women in this PhD program in philosophy, um, and many of them dropping out in first and second year. And you know, I gave it more time, I guess, because I thought maybe it gets better. It never really got better. I mean, it never really did. I just got to the end, I was just like, this is just what it is. <laughs> this is what it is. So I have to make decisions about how I'm going to do this, right? Um, and still be me, still be the kind of person I am, the kind of person my mama raised me to be, um, still be a black feminist, still work for my community, but not work for my community with this sense that I'm bringing back with them ideas from the great fathers of, you know, I don't know, enlightenment and European whatever, to come back and then tell them how to live, you know, that kind of thing, no. <laughs> um, which ultimately is what some people thought that's what I should be doing. I should be coming here, and we saw a, 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 a recent thing, I should be coming here, taking the light to the darkness, <laughs> right? Um, out of the cave, I guess, into the light and taking the light back into the cave. It's just bullshit, man. You know, I was like, you know what, no. <laughs> No, my mom's a really smart person. My dad, my family, my people. Um, but none of them considered to be philosophers proper. None of them considered to be worthy of being touchstones for philosophical projects. So part of you know what I saw myself doing, I really fell in hate with philosophy, and it kept me there because I'm stubborn. You know, <laughs> I was like, I hate you all. I'm going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. You will have to deal with me all the days I'm alive. <laughs> and I think that in some ways, I see now why you chose me. <laughs> because I never have a different message. It's always I hate this. Um, but I, I, do, I do think, I mean, so I did learn, we'll talk a bit, I know you want to talk a bit about why we still stay. Um, but I found it to be probably one of the most, the belly of the colonizing beast. That's what I thought it was. <laughs> I thought professional philosophy had not yet realized that if Kant died, nothing would have changed. It not yet realized why we read Kant, why we read Plato, and it has a lot to do with blood, guts, violence, disease, and just death. <laughs> The colonizing of this land, the uninterrupted settler colonialism of this particular place, <laughs> and that's why we still read these kinds of things and act like they are somehow greater than anything else. <laughs> um, that's not a story they tell you in graduate school, but that's certainly the one that I, I picked up fairly early in graduate school. I thought, oh, we're still reading Kant because this is a colonial nation. I get it. Because um, why else would we? I mean, really, come on. You've read that. Um, and then, I mean, the guy said, you can't lie. I was like, really? Sometimes you gotta lie just to make people feel better. You look great. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's what it means to be a good member of society. I mean, I just, I mean, that's just, there's, there's something about that. There's something inethical about not lying. But I do think, I mean, so this is one of the things that I, when I picked that up, and I picked it up early, too early, I think, to really be a great student in the classroom, so I'm glad I didn't encounter you earlier because you might have a different impression of me. Um, but I, I, I picked it up early, but people like Ron Sundstrom, which was one of your students, um, who has stuff to say about you, wonderful things to say, um, was one of the few people who were like, well, you know what? I guess you're just going to have to figure out how you're going to do this yourself. Because the good thing about philosophy is it is what you do. 
Um, that's literally what he told me. The good thing about philosophy is it, it will be what you do, just get through this, right? Um, and, I, and I believed in that enough to actually continue the journey. And you know, so far, it's not always, doesn't always work out that way, and I don't want to be Pollyanna about this particular field, but for me, this actually ended up working that way. I get out, I get a job. <laughs> That's a miracle that it is that. And then decide just to do what I wanted to do. Because ultimately, I did not work for tenure. I didn't write the way people said you were supposed to write for tenure. But the things that I wanted to read, um, I wrote it the way I wanted to write it. I didn't quote the people that people thought I should quote. And I put it in places where people thought weren't good publications. And I didn't care. <laughs> um, either they were going to give me tenure or they won't. And life is going to go on, right? Um, and I think that, so thank you for that later, because I'm sure that's one of the reasons why I got tenure. And <laughs> I, I think ultimately, in the end, it, it has been interesting to watch my name actually recognition go up in some ways. Is it visibility? That's the word for it. Yeah. Uh, visibility, because ultimately, from what I was told in graduate school, that, that I shouldn't have expected anything like that for the kind of trajectory that I've actually gone on in the kind of game I refuse to play. I just refuse to play the recolonizing game of professional philosophy. <laughs> I refuse to value things that I should never find value in. If someone has anti-black statements, if someone is saying that I can only learn reason at the end of a whip, I don't see any reason to rehabilitate this person. There are other people I should talk about. Now, you can talk about them if you want to, <laughs> but why me? Why, why must we all be engaged in this? Why must we all have the same fan fictions? So my... Um, alienation in some ways um, made it so that I had a very different trajectory, though we made it to the same place, mm -hmm. epistemology, right? Yes, yes. And, um, <laughs> so that is a good segue into the second stage of this conversation, which is um, we're both of us kind of free-range practical epistemologists, and the range that, that I've been roaming around in freely has mostly been this university. Um, and uh, many of you in this room have been, in fact, the subjects of my epistemological research, um, despite my never having gotten IRB. <laughs> um, as an epistemologist, I'm really, really interested in how knowledge gets created, who gets to do it, who counts as knowing, mm -hmm. how does it get shared, how does it get criticized, who trusts it or doesn't trust it, who ought to trust it, and more maybe if they do trust, they do trust that they shouldn't trust it. Um, that is what makes it trustworthy. How is it institutionalized? Um, what kind of thing is a university? Um, how is it related to the various communities in which it's variously embedded, uh, vulnerable, having effects on, and so on. Um, and it's been just incredibly fascinating to have this huge university to wander around in. And I've been very, very lucky to be able to do a huge amount of wandering. Um, including three years that I spent as an associate dean in the graduate school with very little in the way of formal responsibilities and pra you know, virtually no power, but a title <laughs> and a wonderful, wonderful dean, Christine Mazar, to work with. And at a time when we were doing a whole lot of stuff on um, responsible <coughs> conduct of research. And that allowed me to do a lot of wandering. I've also, for about, I think maybe 10 years now, been part of a group called um, Nibi Manoman Bridging Worldviews. Uh, Nibi is an Anishinaabeg for water, Manoman is wild rice. And it's a group that was started by um, Anishinaabeg people in this state out of very, very grave concerns they had with research that the university had been doing on wild rice. And um, this is the idea has been to sort of help get those concerns and that perspective and the way in which if the rice is threatened, the people are threatened. So what's the connection between a seed and cultural and, and actual genocide? Um, and, but also to learn how do you think together? What does it mean for people for whom seeds and plants are ontologically such very, very different kinds of things if you take them to be your relatives or if you take them to be your object of study and manipulation? 
Um, and it's been fascinating working with that group and getting um, Kyle White, Christie's partner and colleague, co-author, mm -hmm. involved in, in that work as well. And he was sorry he was unable also to join us here today. Um, and I've been, uh, when I first arrived, I got involved with what was then Women's Studies. I chaired the department in the mid-80s, and it's been a very, very core part of my, of my life here. And the colleagues that I've had there have been just, and colleagues and students I've worked with, have been just amazing. So um, it's been, being an epistemologist has been, a, for me, a way of engaging it critically engaging and so help right right now at the moment I'm you know up to here in union organizing um, and so figuring out how to be a, a loving troublemaker um, and been you know just sort of being able to just wander around the university, but always thinking, I mean, you know, people thought I was in the room with different kinds of hats on or doing different things, being a committee member or whatever. In my mind, I was always being an epistemologist. And that uh, that was a useful thing to be. Um, and you have a story about epistemologists being useful. Yeah, I do. Well, I mean, the, I, before I do that, I get to say that, you know, one of the ways that I, was, I managed to get through graduate school was the coming across the feminist epistemologist. So mm -hmm. you, um, Linda, who's in the audience as well, Linda Alkoff, and um, even the piece by Liz Anderson, that there was a thing mm -hmm. as politically engaged epistemology. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't come up on that on my own. I actually read you, so I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I very much appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you know when I was searching for something to do in a field that I clearly wasn't uh, necessarily buying into the uh, the mythologies, knowledge work seemed the most interesting because I was always interrogating why the people around me thought they knew anything. I'm like, why do you <laughs> think you know what you're saying? You know, the con the cons ethics I keep coming back as my first class, but there are others. Um, but you know, the ethics, the ethical intuitions, which become the bedrock fact of something. They're like, well, obviously, and what's so obvious about that? <laughs> and how does that become something that which which you have a doxastic attitude towards? What is doxastic attitude? To take on what kind of traits. I mean, it became really um, interesting to think about knowledge. But then, really, I've always been concerned with knowledge. I've been concerned with knowledge since I was very, very, very young. I actually think that that probably has more to do with the fact that I was raised by black feminists because black feminists have been concerned with knowledge for over 200 years, <laughs> trying to figure out some knowledge problems, some of which I'll be talking about uh, tomorrow. So, when I got into epistemology, it seemed like the one area that I thought actually merged a bunch of the interests that I had. The, the interest that I have in social justice, particularly with respect to you know, black girls, um, women, and gender non-conforming folks. And I mean, the interest in just why people think they know so much. Like, I'm just so interested. I'm so interested in why folks think they know so much. They just do, though. They walk around like, oh, I know that. Do you now? What is the story about that? So in some ways, I'm the perfect three-year-old that got stuck. No, I really, I love that story because that does describe me. So maybe I'm perfectly fine where I'm at. Because <laughs> I, I think that I'm just, I'm shocked by all the things that people think they know. But this, it's an important question when one starts thinking about social justice work. So this, the story that Naomi was alluding to was, um, I worked for the Why We Can't Wait um, campaign, which was the campaign that actually pushed against President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative ran by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, and one day Kimberly Crenshaw <laughs> called me up. It was like a Tuesday, and she was like, listen, I'm about to get into a fight with the White House. I think I'm going to need an epistemologist. <laughs> Nobody says that. I mean, I think it's valuable in the way that you think it's valuable. I go around the world being an epistemologist, troubling the water. But it strikes me that I never heard that. And, and ultimately, it was interesting, the work I did there, work that I have to, after having done it, understand it a certain kind of way. At the time, I didn't understand it this way. But ultimately, what I ended up spending a lot of time doing was figuring out how an initiative that was supposed to be about youth of color, specifically, became a boy of color initiative. How do you move from youth of color stats 
that identify populations who are um, in need of help to, and now we're gonna focus on boys of color. How do you get from there to there? Um, what, how are we constructing knowledge in that moment? So I spent a lot of time actually trying to articulate, find the ways in which girls were being actively disappeared from the narrative, because they were in it in the beginning, but they weren't at the end, and how does that happen? Um, and how has it become unproblematic? How does it happen so that people don't even notice it's happening? So I spent a lot of time talking about and, and thinking about how the messages coming out of the White House were disappearing girls of color, um, specifically creating ignorance around that disappearance too. So not just the disappearance, but then the disappearing of the disappearance. I spent a lot of time doing that and uh, talking to Kim and Brittany Cooper and a bunch of other folks who were doing fantastic work um, doing the op-eds and the tweets and the social media campaigns uh, about what I was seeing in the White House messaging, which ultimately was a set of epistemological skills that really helped me with that. Um, not just the disappearing aspects, but actually how the positions, when they were grounded, how they were epistemologically grounded. Safety account, evidentiary accounts, things like that. So we can construct apples to apples accounts um, for the narratives. And it was a fairly successful uh, campaign, it seemed to me. And I do believe that being an epistemologist there was actually quite useful. Um, that not that the yeah, it did kind of surprise me, I'm not gonna lie. But I really did always imagine that there was something about the way knowledge works in our world that oppresses people. That's why I work on epistemic oppression, the way in which we understand things, um, the way in which we try to understand things actually has a danger to it, and that danger is not always apparent. Um, so I figured if I gotta be in philosophy, then I'll commit myself to this kind of path. But I don't think I was the first to. Um, you were doing this. Other feminist epistemologists were doing this kind of work. So I got to, uh, to join an already going conversation that, and didn't have to recreate that particular wheel. The black feminist part, maybe that's something I had to do. But <laughs> the other stuff, not so much. Hey, um, I think we should throw it open for, um, I mean, questions, of course, but you know, responses, thoughts, <laughs> reflections, provocations. The questions for Naomi talk? and Christy. <laughs> oh. Do you want us to keep recording? Oh, yes. um, <laughs> sorry. Does anybody object to us recording the questions and answers? We'll leave the camera focused forward. Yeah, so okay. we get your voices, but our right. facial expressions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the floor is open. Come on. <laughs> what? We good? <laughs> oh, okay. You were saying I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, Rona, Alan, and yeah. Rona? Oh, I didn't talk to him. Oh, oh, I thought. Oh, oh, it's where I'm sitting and Linda's <laughs> hands seem to be coming out of your shoulder. <laughs> Linda. <laughs> well, I'd love to hear y'all talk about um, what, why you feel optimistic about the future of philosophy, if you do. Right. That's the question I was about to ask her if none of you asked questions. <laughs> so I would like to hear the answer to that, Naomi. <laughs> I mean, you've got a long view, you've got a less long view, but you can also sort of see. Naomi, you've certainly seen changes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, part of the answer, <laughs> another part of the answer, um, a, uh, there are a, a number of graduate students in the room. There's um, an undergraduate who is about to head off to Michigan State Yay. as a graduate student. Um, it's, I think, I mean, the, the world is changing. And I think that philosophy as an academic discipline is in a state of crisis. Um, I think we've gotten stuck with a bunch of problems that emerged out of a real political, economic, social, and cultural need. That is the creation of Europe and of the European man. I mean, I guess I don't know that I want to consider it a need, but a lot of people, they wanted to do it. And it was this real project, it was really happening. And I mean, 
that's not the project right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think philosophy is partly in crisis because we have not yet figured out how to formulate the questions, the problems. I mean, I'm um, much less concerned with answers than I am with problems, with figuring out what problems do we have, what problems ought we to have. And if the, I mean, what happened, what the liberal politics got framed by increasing inclusion. So more and more people getting to stake a claim to being in all relevant respects the same as these empowered guys. And that politics made quite a bit of progress, um, still has a lot to go, but since sometime in you know, the 20th century, more and more people have been defecting from that as the goal. I mean, I don't have to tell you this, because you're one of the people I've learned it from. But um, the idea that um, what we should be doing is let this very, very narrow definition of what it is to be human be extended to more and more people who get to do it in various forms of drag. Uh, that's not the vision that many, many people in the world have from post-colonial, decolonial perspectives, anti-racist perspectives, many feminist perspectives, the uh, distinctively queer as opposed to civil rights part of GLBT activism and so on. Um, and if that means that the unitary philosophical we is not going to work anymore, so we live in a world of irreducibly diverse voices and perspectives enmeshed in relationships of power and privilege and vulnerability on a planet that is undergoing you know, climate change as well as all kinds of other things. We desperately need a transformation in philosophy. And philosophy is partly articulating what is it to be a person we're desperately in need of new ways of doing that. And there are lots and lots of people who are eager to jump into that project. There's enormous resistance. But, I mean, why am I optimistic? Why am I still alive? I mean, I don't know any other way to be. I mean, it's the you know, pessim <laughs> pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, Gramsci's thing. I mean, you know, it's what you do is you hang in there and you try to make the change and help make the change that needs to happen. Um, but there are so many terrific young people who are trying to do that. So e even, even, even my you intellect is no every now and then optimistic. Um, yeah, Alan, you knew that was going to put it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, just sorry. Quickly. Yeah. I'm not as optimistic. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not optimistic. I think the things that, that Naomi's talking about are real. Um, I think the way in which we're being included is very tokenist. Um, and I think that um, the people that they're including, and I will actually even count myself as how, you know, the visibility that I'm actually acquiring is off the backdrop of the fact that I'm, I'm fairly theoretical, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm a theoretical philosopher, and, I, and I'm not, I wish that, that's just how I was raised, that's just how I made, I mean, I wish I could do something different, but I can't. But some of the more practical projects that are still so complicated and so complex, but don't actually speak a language of theory, aren't being taken up seriously in philosophy. The ones that are more on the ground, people who have, and they could have these huge, you know, even the, the neoliberal academy's value on money, I mean, two point, you know, two million dollar projects, not philosophy, right? Um, I worry myself about who gets included and why. And I think that there's a story about why I get included that says it's not changing much. Um, but that doesn't mean that the things that Naomi's saying, because there's a time when I could have been that way and still not been included, right? So there is that much progress. I'm going to say that, that that's still a difference. That's a difference that makes a difference. And then I worry about, you know, just how much change is happening to the conception of philosophy. Um, but that's... That's just quick, I know there's other hands. <laughs> so I'd like to invite you both to comment a little bit more on the history. Um, so Naomi, you rooted um, a lot of the uh, difficulties in this early modern kind of nexus. 
Um, but I wonder to what degree uh, you see um, deeper connections um, back behind that. So you mentioned skepticism, which of course has a long history back behind the early modern period in some sense, early minds are recovering some of that. Um, and then moving forward to what degree more recent things in philosophy are relevant, such as the professionalization mm -hmm. of the discipline in the 20th century, um, which brings about certain sociological dynamics for <coughs> what it means to be a philosopher, and those really don't hit until the, well, they probably don't hit strongly until mid-century, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. post-World War II. Yeah. I think that that's right. Um, I mean, the the farther back history, I don't know as much about as I should, but I, I do know that part of what happened when Europe was making itself up was it helped itself to 5th century BCE Athens and said, you know, this is sort of proto-Europe and this is, you know, and it told stories about, you know, that time in Greece. Um, that then sort of both detached Greece from everything else around it and jumped over the intermediate, you know. So, so the way that the history went into forming the discipline is not the same as other ways of telling that history. The thing about the more recent, the professionalization of the academy, I think is a really, really important point and the way that the discipline got disciplined in terms of professionalization. The other piece of what was happening post-World War II was McCarthyism. And so you have um, very, very politically motivated philosophers in Europe, many of them Jewish, um, most of them socialists, um, passionately doing philosophy, needing to escape from Europe, being taken in in the United States with a pretty explicit bargain being stuck, which was, you leave your politics back there. Um, and um, the, the way in which the professionalizing of the discipline went along with the depoliticizing of it, and this happened across the academy, across the humanities, across the social sciences, the purging of <coughs> philosophy, include uh, the purging of politics, including in that purging attention to the, the world beyond the text. And so, you know, I know Susan McClary, who's a feminist musicologist, needed to rebel against the idea that what you're studying are the notes on the page. I mean, they weren't even supposed to play those notes on a piano. I mean, that's contaminating, right? And the you know new criticism in literary studies, and it happened in art history. The I, the fetishizing of a very narrowly defined object of study that made it safe from anything having to do with politics, and that was partly the repressiveness of McCarthyism, and partly a defensive response on the part of the academy, and then the scientism that overtook a lot of the social science and warped them away from interpretive um, approaches toward more quantifiable and so on. So a lot of that I think is very much of a piece of it. And then the idea that, that philosophy is supposed to look like science. And I'm really, really struck that you know, certainly among my, my colleagues, especially, you know, Alan and others in the philosophy of biology, studying science doesn't mean looking like science. And the philosophers of science that I know are among the least scientistic people um, around. And much, in many cases, they're open to a very critical perspective on, on science. So in a way, it's sort of a perfect storm that played out differently at different historical moments. But you're right to point to the importance of different historical moments. Oh, I'm not going to do any better than that. <laughs> no, I have nothing. Um, I, have, I have nothing. I mean, I, 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 I've just read recently Sandra Harding's book, Who Puts a Lot of That Together for yeah. Me Too. So I think that that, that makes sense. I, I also think that the helping themselves to the Greece, Greeks, quote unquote, um, and then the exclusion of um, the Arabic translators, is part of the colonial narrative that we still have today. <laughs> At the exclusion of non-white, non-Europeans, however we construct that, has been part of what it meant to do philosophy when it began that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And that's where some of the resistance comes from for someone like me doing what it is I do. This was explicitly excluded, even if it was a necessity for the tradition itself. <laughs> and that, you know, those are the things that kind of, uh, that's the uninterrupted part. That's the part where I'm like, how does that get disrupted? Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, I mean, putting people in there and call it out, I mean, that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, that, that's the little bit I would add to the continued project of that is not in the past, it's still happening. So turning away from professional philosophy, I'm interested in your thoughts on higher education and especially the frame of grand challenges and big questions that are very much present here and also across higher ed, at least in the US, um, and where epistemology, where this, the theoretical framing, the awareness of intersectional issues, the work that you do, where can that find its way if um, I personally never made it out of the con class, so <laughs> yeah. not all students are going to find their way into maybe higher level philosophy. So yeah. more of a Okay, so yeah, I, you, do you want to let the more pessimistic person talk? <laughs> I don't think we should do that. I think we should keep going the way we're going. Okay, okay I'll talk first. Because she's looking at me like you need to talk. Um, I, I think, so I'm pessimistic <laughs> about philosophy and higher ed. For some of the things that I was saying at the end of this question here is that the way in which it's constructed itself, the way in which it self identifies as a discipline, but I think higher ed has this problem as well as what is, you know, me search versus research, that kind of question you get. I mean, you know, it's funny, it's funny these things. You know, I, I can work on black women social theorists and a German man can work on Heidegger and somehow that's just not me search. But mine is, right? Heidegger is like a German philosopher. I don't know how that's not me search. <laughs> but I mean, if we're if someone's doing it, then we're all doing it. That's one of the points. But that's not how it's looked at though, right? This is scholarship and what you're doing seems like politics. Go back to the question of how we separate those things. I'm not certain that philosophy is the only person. I like the way you've widened this, because I don't think philosophy is the only discipline that has its problem. Um, I know it's not. Um, <laughs> the only discipline that has the problem of, of um, opening up the, the inquiries, opening up the domains of inquiry, in all the ways one would have to open it up to genuinely diversify the academy, right? Um, philosophy does have these problems, but we're not alone. And I think there is a worry about what kind of performances are required to get through the golden halls, the hallowed halls, if you will. Because <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, I'm glad you brought attention to not getting through the con class. I mean, therefore, but for the grace of some higher power, I made it. But the question is, this is back to my pessimism here. Boy, I was a rare few, wasn't I? I mean, really, very rare. <laughs> And rare in, my, in a department that had nine African-American women, <laughs> right? So what it would actually mean, it's not just bringing bodies into the space, right? I mean, what it would actually mean to diversify this field, and I'm not certain that's happening in the way it should be, but what it would mean to actually create a curriculum, um, uh, an understanding of what it is that higher education is about, what is it about the academy, what kind of jobs we're even preparing people for in the end, that would actually lend itself towards genuine diversity. Um, instead of those who are able to do what you do as well, if not better, plus what we do, right? Because that's what it takes to get out of a PhD program in philosophy right now. I, was, I didn't get a chance to be black feminist Christy Wells, a PhD student. I had to do exactly what everyone else did. <laughs> exactly how everyone else did it and keep and retain my sense of why there was something wrong with that. <laughs> that's a lot, right? That's a lot to actually learn the performance at the level of a professional just to shed it when I have the opportunity. Right? And I, I think that's a, I worry about that, right? I mean, I worry about that to the point where I put in print that I, my sister was interested in philosophy and I didn't dissuade her, but I prayed for the first time in my life. Please don't let her go into philosophy. <laughs> Damn, this is rough. Um, you know, and, and I think that you very easily see, um, you know, for example, I saw black women quitting and thinking with their own sense of self in tatters, right? Not the field somehow being a problem, but them somehow not being sufficient. I find that problematic, you know? Um, and that's the way the, the mill runs right now. And, and it's, a, it's a problem. So I think, and you think about that in terms of higher ed itself, I think that's, that's what you kind of get. Um, we, we had an experience, there was some wonderful, I've run into wonderful, wonderful, smart, um, younger students, young students of color here in the past month or so, 
all of which very much touting a narrative of Western philosophy is the light um, in a way that's probably going to ultimately alienate them from their communities. Right? The sacrifices, the consequences of what it means to get here and then be a beacon of something different, I think that's it's a lot to ask right now. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a I, I want to just frame out the problem that you're saying and say, gosh, I really don't know. But I do wonder if we I get people specific and, and literate on the kind of labor it takes to go through the academy to this particular level in a field or discipline that was not prepared for you and has no intentions on changing because you've appeared, <laughs> um, and what it takes to survive that and be successful. Maybe people will change, but I don't know. I mean, because people think that's just what you should do, right? I mean, just prove your prove that you're a real philosopher, and then you know. So I don't know, but I do think it's a real set of problems that I think is higher education wide. Yeah, I think that um, that higher education is. I mean, it's being threatened in all kinds of ways, but it's also an extremely important site for the replication of power and privilege, and that. It's, it's important that it not be abandoned to people who don't care about these things that we care about. And so that partly means that those of us who find it a less soul-destroyingly corrosive place to be have an obligation to try to make it less soul-destroyingly <laughs> corrosive for, for others Fair and enough. to try to hold open spaces and make it, make it more livable. Um, because the, the power and privilege stuff is going to keep on going here. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, Shabir? I had promised to myself I will be quiet. I don't <laughs> ask any question because I'm a nobody. I'm a physical scientist to be here listening to philosophers, my ex colleague. Um, but I got an email from a good friend interested in art and anthropology and so on, an African American woman who wrote that I just returned from Paris. And you people should really go and see the new museum, <laughs> Branly Museum of you know, History of Human Beings and so on. Because it shows how different societies have been thinking about the same things for a long time. <laughs> and when I went to Branly Museum, and I looked at the uh, displays of what used to be called in the political incorrect times primitive people and their faith. <coughs> and they were from everywhere, from India, from South Asia, from Australia, and so on. But they all fitted into a kind of 19th century French philosophical model of how people relate to nature and how you can see the same attitudes everywhere. And it's all explained, except nobody admits in the beginning as to what is the structure that has been chosen. Right. Right. And I was taken back to 19th century. I thought, <laughs> you guys ought to be working hard because nobody knows that things have changed. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been to that museum and I was horrified by it. <laughs> For, I think I, I shared your, your reaction to it. And yeah, it's. Um, I, I guess I. I I do think there's some wonderful stuff in the philosophical canon, um, but it's you can't pick the good parts out and ignore the rest of it. Um, I mean, it's a very, very tangled heritage, and it's horrific. And um, I mean, I just finished writing a paper uh, called On Maverick. And it's for a volume on the fact-value distinction. And what it, one of the things I was writing about is um, what it means to say that the facts are staring you in the face, 
Um, which literally makes no sense. I mean, in fact, it's not the kind of thing that can in the <laughs> um, And But what it means, who am I in the light of those facts? And I think a lot of the resistance, in particular, that white people have to acknowledging the reality of the lives of people of color here and around the world is the awfulness of acknowledging who am I in the light of those facts? Um, what does it say about what it means to be white? What does it say about what it means to be on this land that was stolen, in this case from the Dakota people? Um, what does it mean to be the inheritor of a country built on um, African labor? Um, I mean, what do all these things mean, and what does it say about me as the inheritor of that? And, you know, I don't get off the hook by saying, well, you know, my grandparents were all born in Poland, and, you know, they would no. Um, it's, it's a heritage, it's a world, it's a way of thinking, it's a university, it's a set, all of that sort of stuff. Who am I in the light of that? And that's so hard to ask. And, and then how do I engage in serious relationship with people whose lives, whose histories, whose families are very, very different from that? How do we figure out how to live together? And it's not open to me, it's not open to me to just get rid of the philosophical heritage, and that's not what you do either. <laughs> um, the, you know, it's, it's there, we have to grapple with it, but we have to do that without denying, you know, who's, on whose bodies were these texts written, <clears throat> whose labor made the leisure that produced these texts possible, I mean, all of those questions. And we have to have the courage to do that, and I don't know whether, you know, we, whoever we are, will be able to do that, but I, what's the alternative? Harry? No, I appreciate the, appreciate the discussion. Um, I, I much appreciate your epistemology of participation, of engagement. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems to me that that move is very important. So we are, whatever our titles or degrees or disciplines or frameworks or backgrounds, we're not apart from the human lot, <clears throat> what Jane Adams called the common lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, it strikes me that, that your, your narrative, the other maneuver is a kind of uh, epistemology of solidarity and oppression, which is more complicated. Mm -hmm. So I don't hear much epistemology of agency. So, I mean, for example, and I think that's that's a global problem as well. So, as you know, part of the time in South Africa, the apartheid regime um, has two overwhelming narratives. One is the victimization of black South Africans during apartheid, and the other is the terrible um, oppressiveness of whites. And then, juxtaposed to that, you have ANC leaders addressing mass rallies. So, what's missing from that? is the politics and the epistemology of agency. Mm -hmm. All of the molecular processes in the black consciousness movement, in the women's, the great saying of the UDF that uh, upon this rock apartheid will fall, the strength of women and resilience and the power and the strategy and the savvy and the capacity. And it strikes me that we're living in a time when young people today, pedagogically, see very little um, strong stories of the epistemology of agency. Of how do you actually make a difference if we think the world is crazy and mm -hmm. screwed up and oppressive and full of injustice? And, and that also goes to a, a problem with this one-sided focus on oppressiveness, which is just the Manichaean tendencies in our politics. I mean, Ella Baker used to tell me I work for the Civil Rights Movement, as you know. Mm -hmm. The world is not, it, the difference between the sane and the sinner is about 10%. The world is not divided between the righteous and the damned. Mm -hmm. And the innocent and the oppressed and the oppressors is, is the way we construct the world, but actually to change the world we have to 
develop a different narrative of power and agency and capacity and, mm -hmm. and democracy, which is, of course, in a deep sense, but the movement was all about. So just speak to the question of agency. Easy question. Um, <laughs> well, a, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts in relation to that. I mean, one is um, I owe practically everything that I know about um, in, engaged work um, to uh, Susan Gust, who is sitting there, who um, was involved in a long collaborative, the Phillips Healthy Housing Collaborative, that was a very, very deeply collaborative research project of people in the Phillips community and some people in the university. Um, so uh, Susan and, and Kathy Jordan was unable, I think was unable to be here today. Um, uh, I was lucky enough, was one of the things I did when I was in graduate school, was get together and work with the two of them and learn from them. Um, they didn't know that there was such a thing as community-based participatory research with acronyms and everything and people writing about it. They didn't know anything about it, so they just invented it um, with the people that they were working together with. And so I learned an enormous amount from them about that, and it's sort of about agency and about agency across differences of power and privilege and how people can effectively work together. Um, the other piece of that is there's a, um, a graduate student in uh, G Wiz, um, Caitlin Gunn, who's working on Afrofuturism, but also working on, on black Twitter and the ways in which um, social media are being used in the Black Lives Matter movement in order. So new kinds of agency are emerging there. I mean, I, I have never done anything with Twitter and my sense was this is a totally weird and I hope this gets to remain optional for the rest of my life. 140 <laughs> characters is way too small and I, and I don't want to do this and there's all this nasty stuff like that. But what the role that it's playing in mobilizing people in the Black Lives Matter movement is pretty amazing. And so that sense of how people are seizing on you know pieces of technology and forms of organizing and so that you know examples of collective agency are emerging um, you know ways I couldn't possibly have dreamt of yeah um, I guess I'm going to push back on the question um, and what I mean by that is I don't see an epistemology of oppression sitting juxtaposed to an epistemology of agency I don't see them. That's a Manichaean distinction that I'm not adopting. I wasn't. <laughs> I actually think that there's. That wasn't the question. But we can talk about no, epistemology of oppression solely without having it reflect upon agency at all. Of course. That's what I'm trying to say. So my pushback is that is that I actually work on epistemology of oppression almost precisely because it gets slippery and it's context driven and it's so difficult to actually keep track of. And the minute you think you understand it, you actually have to change your entire framework. Um, so that it's a constant process of identifying where it's at, how it's working, where the levers are, where the mechanisms are. Um, and that's, a, that's pretty much a full-time job. Now, to say that epistemic oppression is something like epistemological oppression exists is not to, I think, remove the idea of um, agency um, or autonomy. I don't think they're actually even part of, they're not even in the same discussion for me, but I also want to say, I, have, I can never imagine oppression so thick that it, I have to give a story about agency. You didn't do that to me. <laughs> Whatever you imagine oppression did, it did not necessarily compromise my agency. <laughs> Just assume that. I don't have to give you a theory of that. Assume it. <laughs> assume that I am always more than your oppressions. Assume it. <laughs> and I don't actually get to it a certain way. The way I'm pushing back on the question is, is I'm not giving you a theory of something that you need to assume. If you are not assuming that, that's part of the problem. <laughs> if you are not assuming that agency exists in the midst of oppression, that is part of what oppression has done to our imagination, but not anything that's done to me. So I want to look for, like I think Naomi does really well, where the agency is at, because it's always going to be there. It's never not going to be there. There's no story about oppression that says anything about agency. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's my theory of agency right there. Then there's people who work on this who do wonderful work. There's people working on decolonial futures, 
who do fantastic work. There's the Af I don't know about Afro pessimism. We gotta talk about this. Afro pessimism. <laughs> the oh, I'm very sad. I think it's Afro pessimism. I'm like, mm, now, man, I don't know. Um, some of the Afro pessimists, I don't know what they're doing right. I mean, there's some interesting yeah, Afro stuff. Afro future. Afro Yes. Okay. So the Afro futures, right? They have some wonderful theories. Um, imagining decolonial futures, imagining what a disruption of this settled colonial society would look like, um, and the importance of cultivating that imagination, which I don't think is actually the same of keeping track of oppression. I think it's an entirely other set of tools, um, but sets of tools I think emerge even differently than what it would mean to analyze oppression. So I don't see them actually orbiting the same context. And I, and I really do want to say that if you ever hear a talk that's only about oppression, never, never assume that it is somehow compromised agency. Um, oh, okay, Doug. Uh, or is that somebody else's well, hand? No. <laughs> so I just want to uh, ask about this. The two of you said different things about the CEO's question, why? the repetition of that question. And you, Naomi, were treating it as um, sort of the outcropping or the, it was the resultant of uh, the attempt to create this universal human, male, human, human. So that was why those questions were asked. But Christy said that she, is asking the question all the time. You know, how, how do these people think they know what they are so confident they know? Is there a way of reconciling those two seemingly disparate takes on the significance of, of, of deep skepticism? Um, no, I, oh, I my, what, what I wanted to say was that I think three-year-olds are just going to do this. Um, that is, that they're figuring out who they are, what the world is like, how they fit in the world. They're becoming persons. And that, that gives rise to this sort of questioning that eventually, for most of them, gets disciplined out of it so they learn to ask only proper questions and so on. Um, so it's not that I think that the, the three-year-old's why emerges only from this sort of problematically, you know, narrow privileging, you know. It, it's, it's just there, they're going to do it. But that it's always the particular shape that the questions take, and particularly the questions that remain after one moves into adulthood and so on. Um, those are the residues of very particular projects of becoming a person, because nobody, you know, you never just become a generic person, you're always some particular kind of person. So the particular shape that those questions take, in particular, for example, the philosophical problem of skepticism, is tied to particular projects. But I do think this sort of, this three-year-old thing of not being satisfied with the explanations the grown-ups give, and keeping on asking why, I don't think that that's tied to any, that the, that form of questioning is tied to any particular maturational project. Does that but I, th I think you did, I think, put your finger on one of the things that makes me acceptable to professional philosophy, is that I am a skeptic, right? No, I mean, really. I, and the way that you're actually identifying, because I think you're right. There is, it's not a tension, though. I don't know if I would have called it a tension. I just think that um, at the end of the day, the ways in which my questions translate into professional philosophy, they often translate as skeptical questions, right? So there's a discourse there, and I've said this before, that actually all ends up affording me a kind of privilege in professional philosophy because it's recognizable. Like these kinds of questions are skeptical questions. We've had these forever. Now I have a different origin for the skeptical questions than they have, and that's what Naomi's talking about. Like the origin of these questions haven't always been the kind of origin of the questions that they are for me, right? But the ways in which I get uptake in the field is as a skeptic, right? Um, and it's not clear to me, this is one of some of the, you know, answer to Linda about why I'm less optimistic. That actually affords me a kind of privilege within professional philosophy that makes me intelligible. Oh, I know what you're doing. 
You're dealing with skepticism. It's a pretty radical form, too. Oh, and it might even be a new form. Oh, you're awesome, right? But it's, but it's being translated in this very narrow way, right, um, that doesn't attend to all the social and political parts of it that make it important for me, and actually where it's ultimately contributing to the social scientists that I work for and things like that. That's not, they don't see any of that. They don't need to see any of that because they recognize this and that's enough, right? Um, but I think you, that's a really wonderful way to disaggregate because I really, you heard the skeptic in me because that's how it gets, that, those kinds of questions get translated into professional philosophy. Okay, good. Because I, I wanted to say, I mean, a three-year-old <laughs> is asking these questions. And then you were saying something about the 20-year-old that continues to ask the mm -hmm. three-year-old's questions is somehow not yeah. grown up. Yeah. And I don't oh, I know if that's so. I mean, right. The particular thing that the three-year-old asks uh -huh. isn't what the 20-year-old mm -hmm. asks. Well, they're, they're different, but it's a form of skepticism. Not, being, not finding it acceptable. Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? Well, I mean, I'm thinking of the experience. <laughs> not just a, just, just a form of <laughs> the effort of, uh, of this uh, grand notion of constructing the idea of drugs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the experience that. Um, people, um, students, for example, but sometimes even after that, will have if they're in some other disciplinary space in the university and they ask some questions and they get told that's a philosophical question. And then at some point they figure out that's not just a term of abuse. I mean, it's meant as a term of abuse. Yeah. And then it's not just a term of abuse, it's also a, you know, a department over there. Um, and, but the, the, when it's philosophical is being used in that way, it's sort of not serious. You know, we serious grown-ups are doing something. We're asking proper questions, and you're, you know, asking these questions that don't have proper end blah, blah, blah. And so I sometimes say that I think being a philosopher is a wonderful alternative to being a serious grown-up, um, which is kind of about as much fun as being the designated driver. Um, that, but that it's also, it, it is serious. That is that these questions that are getting papered over that the serious people are not asking can be really, really important. And that's, I think, a, a good sort of skeptical impulse. What are you all taking for granted? What's not being asked here? What is it presumed that all right-thinking people agree upon? And sort of trying to get past that to you know, the unanswered questions, the ones that have, have been you know, sort of the I mean, it's, it's almost in a, in a Freudian sense. I mean, the neurotic residue of constituting oneself as a proper, serious, civilized grown-up. It leaves all of this neurotic stuff that you then, you know, get, you know, you ask about. And I think that there's something wonderfully, importantly subversive about insisting on asking those questions. Um, but I also think that those questions began getting disciplined by a particular project of self-constitution. So that the, a quest for certainty, a sense that the, the best position from which to ask questions is one that isolates the self from the contaminating influences, first of one's own body and then certainly of other people. Um, and the, I, there's a particular way of imagining the self that's going to be able to move in the world in the properly disciplined, generic way. And that that particular discipline gives rise to particular framings of the problem that I, I find problematic. So, but it, it's very, it's convoluted, and, and, and you, you've indicated that I don't quite have a clear way of saying it, but, but thank you. <laughs> so Annie, you get the last question. Oh, all right. Um, so I just wanted to tease out a couple of things and just get your response. So 
Um, we talked about the perfection and skepticism and how you are intelligible or identifiable, legible in, the, in, in philosophy because you're a skeptic and mm -hmm. you're seen in that way. And then there's also been the other theme that's kind of flipped that, which is your skepticism about the profession itself, <laughs> yes. where is philosophy going. So I think that's really interesting. And I think that ambivalence is really important, which leads me to kind of two points. The first is both of you talked about um, kind of your worry about the way you're taken up in the field, so you get tenure very easily, so you're a good girl. Or you, now you're kind of getting amplified, so is it the tokenization that can happen in these fields that become kind of an mm -hmm. alibi for their lack of inclusion, saying, right. well, we have one, two of right. uh, these people. So I'd like you to, to speak about that and how it positioned you, because I'm dealing with this as a junior scholar. I love my field, which is like the evil twin of philosophy and rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> I love my field, and I love theory. But my work has to be theoretical enough so that I'm a legitimate, you know, writer, scholar. Mm -hmm. But then also as a pedagogue, when I teach theory, I get a lot of resistance from students for like, why are you teaching me this stuff? Indeed. So you have to profess <laughs> your profession, right? Yeah. At the same time that you have this ambivalence. So I'd just like you to speak to kind of how you're taken up in the profession and also how you then disseminate or replicate the, the profession. And, and what do we do with that? Because in some ways I'm like, should I continue to Reproduce rhetoric, right. or should it wither and die? Right, and so you know that uh, kind that's of a great question. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, fantastic question. It's it's one I still struggle with. I mean, yeah, you you picked up the struggle. Um, as far as the tokenism in the field, I think that it's only recently become something of a worry for me about how I get taken up in the field because I had this assumption I never would be because that's what I was told. So then I started getting taken up and I was like, what's happening right now, you know? Um, and then I understand the narratives that are being told about me. Oh, you're a skeptic and all these things. So now I'm hearing what, how people have justified my existence. A skeptic of philosophy, a skeptic of knowledge, and we have a long tradition of that in philosophy, of course, right? Um, no sense about where that comes from or why. And, and getting folded in in that way, the question of whether that's truly subversive in any, any way. <laughs> Right? I, and this is where I'm, I'm a little bit more worried about me as a signal or a beacon of change because I think that I've already, I find, I would say I've already been folded into a narrative that is uninterrupted. Um, so what to do about that? I, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, in the end, <laughs> I don't know. I, I produce work that has a purpose. I usually produce uh, pieces for social scientists, black feminist social scientists who want to um, you know, work on, work with, and work, work with women of color, particularly black women and girls without pathologizing narratives. So my work has a very specific purpose. So I mean, in the end, I'm gonna keep doing that because I'm part of a larger thing than philosophy. And you know, I don't know, maybe I'll just keep looking for the opportunities to, you know, be, so the problem is, is that if it, just being irritating is not enough. Socrates was irritating. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just not. You're like, oh, you're a gadfly. No, I'm not trying to fit into the narrative. <laughs> it's like, how? How do you not? How do you not? You know, I mean, this is just, <laughs> I don't know. So the first one, so I don't know. Second, I think it's really, really difficult to, and this goes to the question, the academy question, the larger question of higher education. It's really, really difficult to figure out how to teach something that you don't want to perpetuate the norms for. Right, you know, and but there's the expectation. So this is one of the, the like you're in the, the rock and the hard place between you have students that come in, particularly if they're philosophy majors that may have aspirational goals for getting PhDs in philosophy. So you have some responsibilities towards them to teach them the kind of things that they're going to expect them to know when they get to a graduate program, or the kind of things that they're going to expect them to be able to perform in a writing sample. But those are the very things you think are deeply problematic. You went through that same process. No, I get it. I mean, I get it. I, I, I find that one of the things that I do is um, teach the things that I guess people imagine I should teach, um, but then teach them in a way that actually ends up making so that we ask different questions. So I'll teach the apology, but then on one side of the board, I'll put assholery, and the other side, I will put philosophy, and I'll be like, let's parse out assholery from philosophy. Let's see the difference, you know, and make them think it differently than this guy is just dying for his goal, and then him like it's so sad. Um, you're like, no, he's an asshole. And what kind of community members decides to die over something like that? Who is he, who's he helping? I mean, I mean, there's this moments where you start asking different questions of Socrates as a so-called hero. <laughs> 
right? And that's the kind of things that in some ways I try to bring, if, if there's anything. I may not be able to stop the things I have to teach. Epistemology is so bad for this. And, uh, they can, you know, <laughs> Um, they don't get to, it's so bad for having a real core candidate, like certain issues that the mainstream are doing, right? And everyone needs to know that if they're going to say they're knowing it. And teaching the, the senior level, and all of those, all those students want to go to grad school, right? Um, and then, I mean, finding ways to integrate that, I try to do that, but integration is not often enough. Sometimes you have to disrupt the narrative, right? You have to disrupt what it would mean to actually think about this. I make my students actually do plays based on like the myth of the given and shit like that from Chisholm. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, they do. They come up with these creative performances. There's, you know, roasts. There are all kind of things that I do. I don't let, I mean, it's one of those classes where I ask people to, to put things on the board and, the, and everyone does it all day. And it's just, it's a different class environment because I'm trying to disrupt what I can and, you know, what I can't leave there because I know a disciplinary is a thing, right? Um, but, you know, how much can I disrupt in my classroom process? How much can I disrupt in my classroom questions? How much can I throw into question everything I'm teaching them as I teach it? <laughs> so 